Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Faith Matters Con Conference. I am so honored to be here with you today. What an incredible crowd. Uh, this is something I've looked forward to. I was supposed to be here last year and couldn't make it, and I'm glad I finally got the opportunity to be here and rub shoulders with so many amazing people of faith and those who are struggling with their faith and those of us who are just humans here together. Uh, I, um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about, well, why, why faith matters. And, uh, and so let, let me just start here. In 1831, when Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States and, and wrote his amazing piece on democracy in America, he was fascinated by one thing overall, and that was the way that Americans, this, this new country, associated together and formed bonds of association. He, he realized that everywhere he went, whenever Americans got together, they formed an association, a society, a group of some sort to do something good bringing them together, creating bonds of, of friendship and actually accomplishing good works. He, uh, he said this, he drew this conclusion, if men and women are to remain civilized or become so, the art of association must grow and expand. Now th think about that, the art of association. When was the last time you thought about the art of association? Let me posit to you this, as Americans, as a country, we have forgotten largely the art of association and coming together. Now, of all the associations that he looked at in, in the United States, there was one that intrigued him the most, and it was religious association, because it was the most common. It was the thing that brought Americans together every week. Government didn't have to be big because we took care of each other. That's where our friendships formed, our community bonds formed. That's where we built hospitals and, and schools and churches. Uh, religion was critical to that. Now, I, I lament seeing that, uh, that the fastest growing religious association in the United States are the nuns, um, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, N no, no religion. We, we are less religious than at any time in our country's history. Now, why does that bother me? Not because I think everyone needs to be religious, no. It bothers me and it troubles me because when religion goes away, what replaces that? Where, where do we find those associations if we're not finding them there? There are other amazing places to find those associations, but we're not finding them there either. As Dr. Putnam from Harvard has, has written so eloquently, we are lonelier than at any time in our nation's history. And we are replacing those healthy associations with very unhealthy and toxic tribes. In 2013, 2014, I wrote these words in a publication at the University of Utah that, that I was worried that politics was becoming religion for far too many people. I look back on 2014 with great love and admiration. Would that we could go back to 2014, right? So, so that's the first insidious thing. We've lost our, our associations. We're, we're lonely. We're looking for, we're wired for connection. And so we're finding it. If I, if I don't have any real friends, at least I can hate the same people together on Facebook, right? So politics has become our religion, but something else has happened over the past couple years that, that is just as insidious. Religion has become political. Right? We hear from pastors, bishops, faith leaders all across the country who are exhausted and tired because their congregants are demanding that what used to be a safe space, an identity apart from our political identity, is now infiltrating our congregations. And if Jesus is too woke or if, if, if Jesus isn't woke enough, then we will go somewhere else. Our country cannot survive this type of, of hate and disagreement. And I'm excited to have a conversation with, uh, with one of my favorite people on earth, one, one, one of the people who is most engaged in this work at the highest levels in this country. Please welcome to the stage, Judge Thomas Griffith. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. So, uh, so you ended on a really down note. I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, so, uh, so I'm hoping we can bring it back here let's, over no, the no, next 30 keep, minutes. Let's keep going down. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, the, the social psychiatrist uh, from uh, NYU who's done such groundbreaking work, 
and is not a doom and gloom cataclysmic sort of guy. And yet he said recently, he warns us of what he calls a catastrophic failure of American democracy because, he says, we just don't know what happens to a democracy when you drain all trust from the system. Is that where we are? Yeah, yeah it is. And, and sadly, um, I promise we'll get some, some optimism here at some point. Here, here's, the, here's the sad part. Um, I've met with Jonathan. We've had these discussions. I um, also met with Rachel Kleinfeld, a, a researcher at, at Carnegie, and she studies uh, failed democracies uh, across time, so over history, and, and, and across the world, all across the world. And she will tell you, if she was here today, she told us, she wrote a report on this recently, that, uh, that we are passing every single checkpoint and we're further along than you think to catastrophic failure of our democratic institutions. That's what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about not just failure, um, failure to thrive, but complete failed state stuff. Uh, and, and she talks about political violence, the rise in political violence that we are seeing in our country. Uh, over the, since 2016, there has been a tenfold increase in, in threats of violence against members of Congress. Not a 10% increase, a 10, a 10 times increase. Uh, we, we've had, over, over the past five years, we've had 147 vehicles drive into crowds of people. 147 times. You guys, that doesn't happen in other democracies across, across the world, and it, and it hasn't happened here. Uh, this is where we are as a society, and that, that Overton window where, where we become comfortable or used to things that are happening and just think this is the new normal has shifted so far that it's almost unrecognizable just, just six or seven years later from where we were. So, so yes, sadly, all of the research points in that direction, that if we continue this uh, toxic polarization, uh, I, I tell people all the time, they're, they're, look, I am not a doom and gloom person either. I, I, I'm a natural optimist. This is, does not come easy for me. But I have become more convinced over the, uh, the past couple of years that there, this ends, I, I ask people, where do you think this ends? And, and the answer, it only ends in one of two places. Either we, the people, decide that we're done, that we're not going to keep hating each other and, and driving ourselves apart, or we start shooting each other. That, that's how this ends, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we did the, the second thing once before, and uh, I, don't, I don't think we want to go back there. So t tell us, tell the audience a little bit about Disagree Better, the, the initiative that you've launched at the National Governors Association. Where'd the idea come from? How are you rolling it out? What are your expectations for it? Yeah, so, uh, so as, as we were, as the chair of the National Governors Association, bipartisan organization, uh, Republicans and Democrats, we switch every year right now. I'm the chair. Uh, Governor Polis of, uh, uh, of Colorado is the vice chair, a wonderful Democrat and a great friend. And uh, we get to do an initiative. And, and historically, governors have always done you know, the, the traditional things. We were looking at, at health care policy. Uh, we were looking at energy policy and critical minerals, um, things that we think are really important. Immigration is one that we, we had looked at. And, and it dawned on us, my team, that we, we can't solve the biggest problem facing this country if we hate each other. I mean, look, look at Congress. I mean, my party, we, we can't even elect a, a speaker, right? I mean, it's, it's just falling apart back there. And so, so, so we decided that, uh, that we, would, we would work on this initiative. And, and I, I want to be very clear, this is not just another civility initiative, although we definitely need more civility. This is not about just agreeing and getting along. It is about disagreement, profound disagreement. Our nation was founded on profound disagreement. In a pluralistic society, we have to disagree. But there's a right way and a wrong way to disagree. And so we reached out to, um, to researchers at policy labs at Stanford and Dartmouth and Duke and, and Harvard and other places. And uh, we got the very best research on depolarization. Uh, incredible uh, incredible uh, experiment at Stanford with over 30,000 people where they tested 25 different interventions, including, unbeknownst to us, one of, one of the things they tested was an ad that I did with my Democratic opponent during the 2020 election. Some of you may have seen it, uh, where we, we stood in front of a camera together and said, I'm Spencer Cox, and I'm a Republican, and I think you should vote for me. He said, I'm Chris Peterson, I'm a Democrat, and I think you should vote for me. Um, we disagree on a lot of things, but we both agree that we can disagree without hating each other, that we can, uh, that we care about our state, that we can, thank you, we, that we will accept the results of the election. I mean, really standard stuff, right? And, um, and what, when they tested this with 30,000 people, what they found was remarkable. In, 
in this ad's ability to depolarize, especially uh, the, the perceptions of, of supporting political violence or not, um, this, this ad actually lowered the temperature. So one of the things we're doing is we've asked fellow governors to record these ads. Uh, Bonneville Communications, located here in Utah, is going around the country and filming these ads. Uh, they just filmed one with the governors of, uh, of Missouri and Kansas, Republican and a Democrat. I did an ad with Governor Polis talking about disagreeing better around the dinner table, um, that your, your MAGA uncle and your woke niece can have a conversation without hating each other. Uh, and and, and so we're, we're doing that, but we're doing so much more. We're holding convenings all over the country. We're working with institutions of higher education. We're working with other groups that are doing this, groups like Braver Angels and More in Common and so many uh, incredible groups that are engaged in this and trying to elevate them and, uh, and spread the message of depolarization. Great. So we're, we're, here, we're, we're here at a gathering convened by, by Faith Matters. Uh, most of us here are, are, are people of faith. Many of us here are Latter-day Saints. And, and we've all heard in the last year what many of us think is one of the boldest prophetic messages that we've heard in our lifetimes come from President Nelson. If you can put the slide up, there we go. Where President Nelson is calling us to be peacemakers, calling us in this time of toxic political polarization to be agents of reconciliation. So my question is, how much of your initiative with disagree better is, is informed by your Latter-day Saint faith and, and these sorts of teachings? Well, I, I, wish, I wish you all could have seen my text threads as I was watching him give this, this talk at General Conference. Um, there were, I, I've never used this many exclamation points in my, my life, yeah. uh, as my team and I were, were texting back and forth and, and so excited. Um, wh while I have had conversations about this with um, the LDS Church and, and others, all of our faiths here in, in the state, um, I did not know he was going to, uh, to give this particular talk. Um, I had prayed that he would give this particular talk. And uh, I, 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 talking about politics and religion is a great way to make friends and influence yeah. people, right? <laughs> but here we are, you asked the question. Um, I, I believe that we make a mistake, and, and there, people disagree with this, and that's okay. Um, that, that we make a mistake as political leaders to hide our religion or pretend that we are not influenced by our religion. I, I think we as leaders need to come as a whole person, as an authentic person. This, this is who I am. And, and if, you, if you don't like that, that's okay. You, you, you can vote for someone else. That's, that's the system. But I, I shouldn't pretend like I'm not a Latter-day Saint or that I'm not influenced at all by the teachings of my church. Now, that is different than saying that I do everything the church tells me to do, which is very different. I, I, it, it is incumbent on me to listen to all voices and to bring all voices to the table. And I have made decisions both as a legislator and as a Latter-day Saint and, and as governor that, that uh, the, the church probably didn't love and, and weren't directly supportive of. I worked to get rid of the Zion Curtain in our bars because I thought it was dumb. And, and, and that, um, but, but there was pushback on that. So, so it's, it's okay to have disagreements, but I, I need people to know that I go to church on Sunday. Um, that I have a testimony of, of Jesus Christ, that I believe that he is real, that he exists, and I believe that there is a God in heaven who cares deeply about all of us and that we are all brothers and sisters. And so I, my faith, I, now I, we started the Disagree Better initiative before President Nelson gave this talk, okay? But I do believe that there is something very unique in Latter-day Saint culture and teachings uh, that drives many of us to seek for common ground. Um, uh, President Oaks has talked about this, about the, the, the need for, for uh, on contentious issues, right? For, for moderation, to find common ground, to come together. Um, I, I believe that, that the, the, the most challenging scripture in all of scripture, um, the most challenging teaching of, our, uh, of Jesus Christ, I believe, was, was when he said to love our enemies, to do good to them that, that hate us, and, 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 and that, that is so antithetical to everything the world is teaching us today. And it is antithetical to everything in politics. Politics 101 is to destroy your enemy, right? To attack, to fight back. Um, doing good, he didn't just say don't be mean to your enemies. He didn't say don't say bad things to your enemies. He said we have to do good to those that hate us and despitefully use us. 
that, that informs me every day, and I'm not great at it. I struggle with it. The natural man is still inside of me. I'm, uh, I, I'm, an, I, I, I'm a litigator. I'm an attorney. I'm a trial attorney because I'm really good at tearing people down, you guys. Um, I, this is not natural for me, and I make mistakes all of the time, but I try. So, so I, I want to suggest, picking up on that, I want to suggest that what we have heard from President Nelson and before that from President Oaks is a paradigm shift for what it means to be a, a Latter-day Saint. President Nelson is telling us that to be a Latter-day Saint means you don't drink coffee, yeah, 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 but more importantly, you are a peacemaker. That's, that's your central core religious identity. I'm a Latter-day Saint. I'm a builder of bridges of understanding. Uh, I'm a peacemaker. I'm the one that's gonna try and reconcile people together. So I've been studying the Constitution of the United States for over 50 years of, 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 of my life, and I have never heard a better explanation of what gets at the core of what it means to support and defend the American Constitution than what President Oaks said a couple of years ago in general conference when he gave his talk about the Constitution, and he said these words, I think this is a mantra, on contested issues, we, us, should seek to moderate, and to unify. There's the template. That's what we're supposed to do. If any of us have any questions about what it means to be a Latter-day Saint in the public square, it's been answered for you there. If, if, if your latest social media post didn't reflect that, your latest Thanksgiving dinner didn't reflect that, change, repent. This is the new now. And it, it, it reminds me of the, 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 the scene from The Chosen, when, uh, when the disciples say to Jesus, wow, that's different. And the Lord's response was, get used to different. That this is the different. This is the new us right now. Latter-day Saints are to be agents of reconciliation. And, and it's, it's, got a his, it's got a historic root as well. It, it, we all remember from our school days, uh, learning about the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. Uh, some popular histories have called it the miracle at Philadelphia, that they were able to pull out this convention. Uh, I'm a, a great book called The Miracle at Philadelphia, which I highly recommend. That's it. I, I'm a believer in, in miracles, and typically miracles are things that defy rational explanation. But we know what happened at Philadelphia. It, it does not defy rational explanation. George Washington explained how that miracle occurred. When, when he transmitted the Constitution to the Continental Congress, he wrote a, a letter, and he said, this constitution is the result of a spirit of amity, mutual deference, and concession, which the peculiarity of our political circumstances rendered indispensable. The Constitution of the United States was created on those values. It is only going to be, if it is going to be preserved, it is only going to be preserved by those values again. Amity, mutual deference, concession. Unfortunately, I'm not political, I'm not partisan anymore, but unfortunately we don't see a lot of that coming from our national leaders. And so it's gotta come from somewhere. It's gotta come from, 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 from the grassroots. So, 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 so let, me, let me ask you this. Is there something unique and distinctive about the role Latter-day Saints have to play in creating this climate that pushes back against yeah. to toxic polarization. What, what, what's unique about what we can do as a people? Well, look, um, I, I appreciate you sharing that history, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, as, as we reflect on how this all happened, this miracle of, of this, this uh, multicultural, uh, this, this, uh, this, this amazing, the, the most powerful country in the history of the world came together, uh, and, and what it took to make that happen, things that we take for granted, I think, far too often. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I love, John Adams wrote that, uh, that without the political virtues of humility, patience, and moderation, similar to what the political virtues that George Washington talked about, humility, patience, and moderation, we are all ravenous political beasts. Right, the natural man. We we are naturally ravenous political beasts, and so we need those humility, moderation, these political virtues. But by the way, how many how many uh, how, how many political officials in Washington D.C. would you describe using humility, patience, moderation? 
right? It's, it's a rarity today. And, um, and so I do think that Latter-day Saints, um, ha- let me be very clear, we've not cornered the market on this stuff. And we, we are not perfect, and we make lots of mistakes. Generally, though, there is a, a spirit of, of collaboration, a, a spirit of community, um, a spirit of, of moderation, uh, a desire to unify, and we have leaders like those that you have mentioned that are preaching this, and that is very unique. Again, um, I spoke about the power of religion to bring people together in association. However, as, as, as religions have become politicized, they have become part of the division making in our country today, right? And, and so that is different. And look, this isn't just a governor bragging about his state. I know that's, there's nothing more boring than that. Um, every week, every week, experts, uh, researchers from all over the country and all over the globe are coming to Utah, are asking us, why are you different? There is something different here. And you can't, you can't, you, you can't completely explain that without understanding our history and how we got here and the role that the predominant church has played in getting us here. Um, warts uh, that exist aside, um, this, this call this, and the reception it has received by Latter-day Saints, this idea. And by the way, this isn't new, right? Um, this should not have surprised any of us to hear President Nelson preach these things. This is just the gospel of Jesus Christ from its inception. But it felt new and it felt different and it felt unique because we don't have leaders on the political or the religious scale that are preaching this. And, and so um, my, my, my hope is that, um, that, that our history, whether you've been, uh, w- whether your families have been members of, of, of this church for, uh, for six or seven generations like mine, or you're new, you got baptized into this faith next week, that this will become core to you, um, whoever you are, and that it will spread. Again, there are other religious leaders that believe this and are, are, are trying to do more of this, and that we can find a coalition of the willing um, to help preserve this constitution. So I want to suggest something uh, that's great. I want to suggest something a little more parochial about us that I think really is unique about us. And, and I'll set it up this way. In the last year, I've had about a dozen conversations with uh, public intellectuals, thought leaders uh, who are deeply concerned about the toxic polarization that, that, that you've described and who share your concern that this is different and unique and it is an existential threat to the Constitution of the Republic. That's their background. And they've come to me and they have said the following words. We think the Latter-day Saints are the leaders who can get us out of this mess. Let me give an example. Jonathan Rauch, uh, uh, Brookings Institution, writes for The Atlantic. He was at BYU a couple of months ago. I'm gonna paraphrase his remarks, but it goes something like this. By the way, will you describe who Jonathan Rauch is so that people yeah, understand he, he, his background? Jonathan, and, and I'm gonna do that in the way okay, he good, introduced good, himself. Good, yeah. Uh, he, he's at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., a, a moderate to liberal think tank. He was at BYU a couple months ago, and he began his remarks this way. I'm paraphrasing, Jonathan. He began his remarks this way. He said, I'm an outsider here. I'm an atheist. I'm a Jew. I'm gay. And my husband is on the front row. Have I got your attention? <laughs> and then he went on to say, I'm here to tell you that what the Latter-day Saints have been doing under the leadership of Russell Nelson and Dallin Oaks, what they have been doing in the public sphere based on your experience as a people, based on your theology, based on your concept of a ward. Yeah, he knows what a ward is. He said, you put those all together. He said, it's unique. It's unique in all America. And it is the way forward. He gave that same speech just last week at the University of Virginia, said the same thing. And I'm hearing this not just from Jonathan Rauch, I'm hearing it from others. I heard from a woman who was in Rwanda uh, after the genocide, one of the leading legal scholars in the world. She helped the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. She told me in a conversation, she said, I fear for the future of our country because all of the problems that were existing in Rwanda are here now. I fear the violence. Right. And then she said, and this is a quote, she said, if we're going to get out of this, 
it's going to be because of the leadership of the Mormon church. She hadn't gotten the memo about the name change. She, and I, I, I about dropped my jaw. But I'm hearing this over and over again, that there, that, that, that there are keen observers on the outside who see something about our culture, our faith, our practice that they believe can be powerful. Uh, and so my hope is, my prayer is, my efforts are that as Latter-day Saints, that we see that in ourselves and that we see ourselves, once again, primarily as I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. What that means is I'm working to overcome these, these, th these divisions. Okay, so with that in mind, practical things. If you're not a governor of the state of Utah, if you're not a judge, what, what can you do this weekend to get involved in this process if you really want to help overcome the toxic political polarization? What, yeah, what do you do? It, it, well, th that's, that's the key because, um, I, I, by the way, I'm having the same conversations, and, and they're not conversations that I'm expecting to have. They're people who are reaching out to us and saying the same thing. And, and so uh, they're asking me, well, so what, what, what are y'all doing? Save us, help us, help us. So I, I wanna give you some, some positive news. First of all, um, Dartmouth came back to us uh, just two weeks ago with new data and said, there is hope, and the hope is this. It's not just the Latter-day Saints who are tired of this. Um, it, there is still, what they refer to, we used to call it kind of the silent majority, they refer to it as the exhausted majority. That um, the exhausted majority, and they, they have the numbers, um, are, are, are very tired of what is happening in our country. And, and, and to, to tell you what you can do practically, I need to explain one more thing if that's okay, Judge. Um, and it is this, it's not that Republicans and Democrats believe different things, that's not what's dangerous. In fact, the, the same data showed that Republicans and Democrats in general, the majority of Republicans and the majority of Democrats really aren't that far apart in our partisan beliefs. Supr that will surprise most of you, but we are really not that far apart. Here's the problem. It's not what Republicans and Democrats believe. It's what Republicans think Democrats believe and what Democrats think Republicans believe. That's called the perception gap. That is what is dangerous, right? So... What this mean? And by, by the way, all of the incentives, this is why the practical stuff matters, because all of the incentives are lined up against us. The best thing you can do, the best thing you can do, Abby and I are 11 years sober, we just celebrated, um, not that kind of sober, I'll tell you, okay? hold your applause. Um, 11 years since we stopped watching cable news. Now, I, I, I promise you, we've seen this with family members too, all right? C cable news is dedicated to dividing us. The perception gap began to exist because of cable news, right? If you watch cable news, you think every Republican is Marjorie Taylor Greene, right? You think every Democrat is AOC, wh whatever, whatever. That, those are the extremes that get the attention. Social media, okay, so, so first of all, turning off cable news made our marriage better, it made our family relationships better. There was a spirit that returned to our home that had left our home. The spirit cannot abide. The spirit cannot abide when there is contention. And cable news is built on a model of contempt and contention. You have to turn it off and not turn it on again. Now, social media, Social media has the power to unite and the power to divide. The problem with social media um, are the algorithms. Now, the algorithms are neutral, except that the algorithms crave, one, your attention, and the things that give you, that, that make you pay more attention. Now, the natural man, right, the, the, the ravenous political beast, we slow down for car wrecks for a reason, right? There's a part of us that is interested in terrible things happening. And so the algorithms will always promote the worst of us. So we have to be extremely careful about social media. By the way, our kids should not have social media. I'm just here to tell you, if you want, yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw something a couple of weeks ago that stopped me cold in my tracks. Uh, it, it said this, um, when you're ready for your, your kid's childhood to end, give them social media, okay? Um, so, uh, but for, for the adults in, in the room, um, it, it is so important. In a very real way, what you post on Facebook and, and, uh, and, and on, on X, Twitter, whatever, um, 
impacts this polarization every day. And so what, what, what I tell people all the time is never, never, never talk about those people, right? Attack ideas, not people. Those people are trying to destroy our country. That's you trying to destroy our country, okay? And, and, and here is the most important thing that, that I, learned, I learned last week, um, and that is stop trying to tell our kids to go out and change the world, all right? We, we don't need to raise a generation of narcissists, okay? Let me tell you what, what we should be telling them and what we should be doing, and that is go out and change your community, your neighborhood. We have to start building locally. And the problem with social media is it makes us look at the world like, you know, my voice matters in the cosmic scheme of things. It does, but not in that way. If you want to change the world, you start by changing your community, by building, using the social capital that we have to build our community. And this means, and this is the last most important thing is, this means you have to get, you have to spend time with people who are different than you. You have to, it's the only way. Proximity, proximity is how we solve this. It, there is no other way. I, I want to tell a quick story. I know we're, we're, we're close to time, but I want to tell a quick story uh, about a friend who I disagree with passionately on many issues. Um, Troy Williams is the head of Equality Utah here in, in, in Utah, um, LGBTQ advocacy group. Um, Troy has changed over the years. He will tell you that, and I have changed over the years. Troy used to be a traditional advocate, and that was wait for your opponents to say something you disagree with, blow it up, tear them down, fundraise off of it, and, and, and go to the next battle. Troy has realized that's not changing any minds, right? So Troy did something very remarkable. He bought, a, uh, he, he bought a booth at the Republican State Convention this year. There is no more hostile, but I hear this all the time with disagree. How, I'm not gonna disagree better with somebody who hates me or disagrees with me, wants me to not exist. Why would I engage with them? Here's why you engage with them. Troy goes to this place where there are people that hate him and, and tried to get him kicked out, don't want him there. Okay? Again, Troy and I disagree on lots of issues, very strongly. We've had our battles on policy, but we like each other as human beings. Troy, they trained their staff, they went in there, and here's what, I, these stories just blew my mind. Troy goes in there to hostile territory. Um, so many stories, I'll just tell you one. A guy comes up screaming at him, telling him how awful and terrible, how, how he's destroying the country, destroying our families, um, everything is the worst of the worst, screaming at him. Troy very calmly said, Tell me more about why you think we're destroying the country. Tell me more, why, why do you feel this way? Kept asking that question, tell me more. Eventually the person started talking about his, his family, how much he loved his kids, how patriotic he was. And after listening for a long time, Tracy said, can I tell you my thoughts about family and your family and our country? He, he said, okay, you've listened to me, I'm going to listen to you. Troy did exactly that. Um, the person listened to him. Troy explained how he loved his family, how he cared about this country and this state. They had a different agreement, a diff difference of agreement. And then at the end, Troy said, um, you know what? I want you to have the last word. Tell me what you think I should know before we leave. The guy gave him a hug and apologized, okay? There, there is no other way. Yeah. There is no other way. It's, he saw it, the humanity. He probably didn't buy a pride flag. He probably didn't go out and vote for Democrats right away. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but, but he will think differently before he attacks those people. Yeah, and that's time. the key. The issue isn't that we're all going to agree on things. I don't trust any decision that isn't the product of disagreement, whether that comes from my bishop's office, 47th East South Temple, or Capitol Hill. I want disagreement to be there. It's the contempt that's part of the disagreement right now that's, 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 that's killing us. And, and, and my hope, uh, hearing the prophetic voice of President Nelson speaking about this, I, I yearn for the day when people will say, you're a Latter-day Saint. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It used to be Mormons and Latter-day Saints. Oh, you're the ones that build bridges of understanding amongst people. That's what you all do. I, I think that's what President Nelson is calling us to be, to see our discipleship in, 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 in those terms. President Nelson tells us that in our lifetimes, we will see, and this is a direct quote, the greatest manifestation of God's power. Okay, so let's think about that. What is the greatest manifestation of God's power? Arguably creation, that's a pretty good example. But I think the answer to that is the greatest manifestation of God's power, the thing that God does is at one moment. He brings together people to him 
and us to one another. That is God's power. If I'm right, what President Nelson is hoping for and telling us, that we can work to see the greatest manifestation of the power of atonement, work beyond our church wards, work in our community, work in our nation. That's my hope and my prayer as we follow Jesus and his prophet today. Thank you, Governor, for this Thank time. You, Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.